for us to welcome you, the faculty members of Faculty of Humanities, our dean, manager, lecturer, students, and participants at a public lecture entitled The Maritime Humanities in Indonesia with our speaker, Dr. Elena Burgos Martinez from Leiden University, Netherlands. This morning, we're going to have Dr. Elena Burgos Martinez talk about the maritime humanities in Indonesia. This public lecture is a part of Leiden lecture series and is held by Faculty of Humanities Universitas Indonesia in cooperation with Leiden University, the Netherlands. This session will be followed by a questions and answer session. Next, for the welcoming remark, I would like to invite the Dean of Faculty of Humanities, Dr. Adrianus Laudens Kerungwawaruntu, to come to the stage dan sambutan dalam bahasa Indonesia karena audiensnya Indonesia tapi sudah disiapkan dalam bahasa Inggris <laughs> baik distinguished family faculty members participants and ladies and gentlemen good morning good morning sir. I'm delighted and honored to have this opportunity to welcome you and our, to our beautiful campus and to open today's lecture public lecture by Dr. Elena Burgor Burgos Martinez from Leiden University. Today's lecture is extremely special because it is part of the Leiden lecture series that have been held in this faculty. Last month we hosted several lectures in collaboration with Leiden University, which actually uh, headed by the rector himself, Professor Stalker. Mm -hmm. So we are happy to be given this opportunity to uh, for today's lecture. As the Dean of the Faculty of Humanities, Universitas Indonesia, I wish to extend a warm welcome to Dr. Elena Burgos Martinez to Universitas Indonesia. We are honored to have Dr. Martinez who have extensively conducted research on various topics of humanities around the world, including in Indonesia, sharing her insights, knowledge, and ideas on the topic of maritime humanities, which is still a known thing in Indonesia. As all we know, Indonesia and the Netherlands have developed strong maritime cooperative efforts through multilateral international fora. Our government have worked together in facing various challenges and also the remarkable progress of the maritime world. Therefore, we are very eager to learn about an emerging field of study in the Netherlands, the maritime humanities. I personally believe that today's talk by Dr. Martinez will provide valuable information regarding maritime humanities. I also hope that after this lecture, more of our scholars in Indonesia inspired and encouraged to learn more about this exciting new field of study. I would like to take this opportunity to express my gratitude to Leiden University who has presented us with the opportunity to collaborate in the Leiden Lecture Series. I hope that in the future we can maintain and strengthen this very cherished relationship through more public lectures and other academic events. Uh, and next week or this coming Friday, uh, I myself with 12 other teams from University of Indonesia will go to Leiden. We'll be staying there for a week because we also want to um, visit some university besides Leiden. Well, in closing, I wish all of you have a pleasant time enjoying this undoubtedly enriching session with Dr. Martinez. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. The social linguist and a cultural anthropologist interested in performative identity, environmental theory, and minority languages. She has conducted ethnographic research in small islands of eastern Indonesia, where she researched linguistic alliances and the environmental paradigms these create. Elena has studied research and taught in Edinburgh University, Scotland, and Durham University, England. She is currently an assistant professor in the Department of Asian Studies of Leiden University. Without further ado, I'd like to invite our speaker, Dr. Elena Burgos Martinez, to come to the stage. Selamat pagi semuanya. Aku bisa pakai bahasa Indonesia, tapi bahasa Indonesia aku sedikit gila sekarang. Sudah, sudah lima tahun aku tidak bicara bahasa Indonesia setiap hari. Jadi kadang-kadang pelan-pelan begitu. Em, aku mau bilang, eh, aku saya mau bilang terlalu formal. Em, kalau hari ini em, saya merasakan eh, terhormat, sangat terhormat ada di sini, ada tamu yang spesial juga di sini aku mau bicara tentang aku tapi se e, e, sekarang mau bicara tentang tamu yang spesial ada Pak Haji Sufi Yasir dia orang asal Bajo dari e, Sulawesi Selatan dia tinggal di Bandung sekarang Pak Haji e, expert Bajo juga dia bikin penelitian tentang bajunya tentang lagu-lagu tentang iku iku ada informasi tentang pakaian nanti em, baru ada lagi Ibu Haja Ona juga Ona Rantuang dia orang asal baju dari Pulau Nain Pulau Nain aku tinggal de 2 tahun untuk penelitian, penelitian eh, etnografi di situ eh, nanti mau menjelaskan eh, informasi itu baru ada juga ibu-ibu eh, dari eh, Suara Parampuang Sulawesi Utara Sini. ada Lili Kena dia orang direktor di situ juga. Em, baru ada ibu mana ibu itu? Oh ya, ibu Aru Ariani Tube sini dia penghias wanita bajau di Luwu Sulawesi Tengah. Em, baru ada pacar aku dia orang fotograf. <laughs> baju lagi tradisional juga semua baju ini dari dari budaya baju eh, bikin tangga di Bandung kan ya di Bandung eh, jadi spesial sekali ada informasi tentang pakaian juga saya memulai dengan informasi ini si, ada, ada dokumen ini eh, saya bisa mengirimkan Ya, ya. Ya. Ada dokumen dari Pak Haji. Kalau kalau itu menarik, aku bisa mengirimkan informasi ini. Oke? Okay? Eh, bilang aja aku bisa, eh, bisa mengirimkan itu. Eh, mau bilang? Ya, Anda? Namanya? Tulo. Eh, kalau namanya ini? Tujuada. 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 Juada. Juada. Jadi ini ini spesial juga namanya Tiara ini Sigada 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 ini ada simbolis eh, simbolism is very interesting so the star in the middle represent sea stars and also the the shapes you see around the tiara represent the waves of the sea so it's very maritime in a way and also the patterns you see in the clothes also represent the sea sea animals the waves people so it's all connected in the end. And this is very interesting. Normally you wear this with that. But I'm skipping that a little bit for the, the talk, in a way. So, um, hari ini saya mau bicara dengan bahasa Indonesia, tapi tu, eh, juga pakai bahasa Inggris. Lebih, lebih, lebih mudah kalau aku menjelaskan penelitian aku eh, pakai bahasa Inggris. Kalau pakai bahasa Indonesia, selalu pakai aku dan kamu. Jadi tidak terlalu formal. Um, okay. Sekarang... Okay. So, so 
So today, what I thought, I will start by talking about what I'm wearing, which I've done already. If you, if you like more information, just let me know, or let you Cecilia know, and I will send the document that Pahaji wrote, and you can read more about it. And these clothes are traditional from Bajo of Sulawesi, especially Sulawesi, South Sulawesi and Central Sulawesi. In the islands in the north of Sulawesi where I lived, they don't wear this type of clothes, but they wear similar ones, so it, it, it changes depending on, on where you are. And the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to talk a little bit about myself because she has already introduced me very well, so we don't need to say much. And then I'm going to talk about the place where I lived five years ago in Indonesia, the islands. Then I'm going to talk briefly about environmental humanities, which is a field that might sound more familiar to all of you. And then after, I'm going to talk about the maritime humanities, which is, it is a field that is emerging now, but there's a lot of people who already do maritime humanities work. So it doesn't mean that there's no people who do this type of work. It just, it hasn't been institutionalized as much yet. So, and I think it's a shame, and it's changing now, so that, that's an opportunity. And then we'll conclude with some <coughs> sorry, challenges and, and limitations that, that we can work on. And this is the island where I lived. Um, uh, every morning I would go there with people and work a little bit on the, the seaweed fields, which is a way of doing ethnography as well. So you go there, you work, you're useless because you don't know how to work there, but they teach you. And you make all the mistakes that you have to make as a bule, you always make them. And then, <laughs> but you learn a lot through that. You talk to people in different languages every day. It's a multilingual island, so you talk in, in Melayu, Manaro Malay, you talk in Bas Indonesia, Karankaram, Bas Indonesia Yuga. And, and you're talking about Sama as well, which is the language of the island. So it's one of the Sama languages of the, the north of Sulawesi. It's spoken on, on Nain Island, also spoken around the, the islands, and I'll show you in a second. So she's already said everything there is to know about me, <laughs> other than I have background in education, geology, anthropology, and linguistics. So I study different things. Um, I'm originally from Spain, southern Spain, in Spain Granada. Um, but I've lived in the UK for a long time, long, long time, where I studied, oop, yeah, not yet, not yet, this is the one, where I studied anthropology and linguistics in different universities. And where do I belong? It's so difficult to, to define ourselves. I mean, all of you feel the same way. So where do we belong? To what department do we belong? To what discipline do we belong? To what, to what region, even? We belong to so many of them, so many. So we work in, as a linguistic anthropologist, Anthropology falls in social sciences, the linguistics falls in humanities. So what am I? A social scientist or a, or a humanities scientist? I mean, it changes a lot. Um, so this is uh, what I think feels like maritime humanities can help, because we all fit in, coming from different disciplines and different faculties. So I think it helps uh, with that as well, with the identity problems that we have as academics. And, um, before I used to work in, in disciplinary departments, anthropology and linguistics, but now I work in a multidisciplinary department, which is an area study department in Leiden. And it means that there are many different disciplines involved in using Asia, in, in studying Asia, and studying Middle East, the Middle East as well. So it's Asian and the Middle East in the same department. And that's interesting as well. Uh, I apologize if I move the microphone, so I hope uh, you can hear me. So we already talked about the clothes, so we we'll skip that. Okay. So this is where I lived five years ago. I went to, to the islands for two years. So I lived there for two years. This is Indonesia, right? We're here in Jakarta. The book, not Jakarta. Must Paul, must Paul uh, explain that <laughs> Jakarta is not uh, the book is not Jakarta. So now I know. Uh, before I thought it was the same, but now I know. <laughs> Um, and then from, from there, I went to Manaro. Manaro is here, the capital, you know Manaro, capital of Sulawesi, North Sulawesi. And then I took the, the three hour boat to the islands. So this is Manaro, the Bunak and Taman Nacional, Pulanay. So the, the, the northernmost island of the, of the Bunak archipelago. 
So Pulau Nain is super interesting. It's very interesting. Menarik sekali dia. Ada empat kampung di situ. I made this map, so it's a little bit clumsy. But um, there's four villages. Um, Nain Bajo, Sini. Sama Jalan, Nain Siau. Kalau Nain Bajo, Muslim. Kalau Nain Siau, Christian. Christian. Tapi mereka bersama situ. Menarik sekali itu. Um, di sini ada Tetampi, sini ada Ternate. Kalau kampung Tetampi, kampung Ternate, um, mereka Kristen juga. Jadi yang satu-satunya Muslim, Naim Bajo, sini. Um, I stay with them, I stay here all the time with the Bajo, and then I moved a little bit to talk with them, to, to see our people, to, to the people from here, from here, so you move around the island. But the interesting thing is that this is a multicultural, multilingual island. So every day, you speak Bajo, you speak Siao languages, you speak Manado Malay, because it's the Bahasa Pasar, is the language of the trading and, and the language of, of the, uh, the Labo from Manado, where people go every day, basically. And then you also speak, well, these speak Siao languages from the Siao. See, the Siao languages come from um, Sanihe Islands, so from the north, from Sanihe Islands up here in the north. So multilingual, multicultural, and multi-religious islands are nothing new in Indonesia. They're very common. They're everywhere. Maluku, wherever you go, you can find a multi-religious and multilingual and multicultural islands. So, which is something that I didn't see so much in Europe. Although it also exists, obviously, but I didn't see so much. But it's a feature of Indonesia, and it makes it really interesting. It's one of the, the, the very interesting features. Pictures. So this I didn't make myself. It was made by somebody from Nine Islands. And she put it on Facebook, and she gave me the, the right to use it. And it's a sort of mix of pictures from the island. I think it's interesting to see how people uh, picture themselves in a way, no? How people, what pictures do they decide to put at the front? So you see people, a lady on a boat going home. I think she's uh, collecting maybe Rupert Loud. And then you see daily life here with the tide, when the tide is low, so you know it's probably morning, afternoon, perhaps. And then gathering to prepare. The, the, the trees, can you see the most from there? No, not so much. And, and here, beautiful. So Nine Island is a human island, which is something I learned. Might seem obvious, <laughs> because they are humans, but it's something I learned while being there, because being a human island means something else, okay? Stay with me, I'll explain what, what I mean soon. It's abstract, but I'll explain. So. On this photograph, you see Bahari Juma, he's still alive, he's a very uh, clever man. He's rebuilding this house, he's destroying it first, destroying it, taking it down, the assembling uh, the house and then building it again. Why? Because somebody had died, and the houses follow the same rhythm as people. So when people die, houses die, and they're born again, in new shapes. And, and this is something that I was like, oh, so houses follow the same dynamic and the same rhythm of people, so houses are people in a way. So here we start seeing that we can't really separate the human and the non-human. So, so such division of the human and the non-human, which is a very Western and especially European um, dichotomy, um, that might not work in some of the places where we go. It might work here in the book, perhaps, but in urban settings perhaps, but not, not on these islands, for example. So I had a lot of learning to do when I arrived there and one was these aspects. Um, so now, why did I choose, so I didn't choose the islands because they weren't even on the map before I went there. The, the, the islands sort of chose me, in a way, although as, as cliche as it sounds. But I arrived to Manado and I wanted to find an island that was small enough for me to, to learn as much as I could in only two years. Because in two years to learn languages, I mean, impossible. And with so many languages on one island, it takes a long time. So. I arrived to, to Pulau Nain, the first island I visited, and I, I lost it. I mean, it, it was um, not a touristic island. It was different from everything I knew from before. It wasn't so comfortable. There were no toilets where I could sit. <laughs> but I needed that. I needed something, um, as you just sounds again, I needed something different to think about language and think about culture and the human in a different way that I had been thinking as, a, as an urban person, as a, as a person of the city. And, and this was completely contrasting, completely different. So I went looking for something different, and in the end you find common things as well, so it's not all different. There's a lot of commonalities as well. And 
But Nine Island also is interesting because it's the most populated island of the Bunaken, Tama Nacional. So there's um, 1,500 people in a five square kilometer island. So very small island with 1,500 people. What happens that when elections come, all the politicians want to go to Nine Island because more votes, right? <laughs> so you go to Nine Island before you go to Montehagi or before you go to Bunaken even because Bunaken is full of tourists, but they don't vote. So politicians go a lot to Nine Island, and that gave me an idea. I saw a lot of politicians going there from different uh, parties, campaigning, and that, that helped me see a lot of life in just one island by being there. And um, there's a mixture of Christianity and Islam, and obviously, as I said before, the interesting thing as well, while I was there in 2013, the island became, for the first time, a four-village island. For the first time, acknowledged as a four-village island on documents in administration in Wari, Kechamatan Wari. Before it had been assumed to be one, uh, one village island and everybody were the same, right? They thought for administrative purposes, let's put everybody down as Bajo. All the Siao, all the, all the other people, which is Bajo. And yeah, that wasn't um, real even. So, but in 2013, they wanted them to vote in the elections, 2014, sorry, they wanted them to vote in the elections, the general elections and the local elections. And they granted them the four village island identity on paper, on documents that they wanted before, in exchange for voting in the in the formal way. Let's say there's all the traditional ways of voting as well. Araque Paladés ayuda, that the the process is different. So the traditional forms of um, electing um, heads of the village also happen at the same time as formal ways of voting for politicians in a way. But I'm not going to talk about that today. There's a lot of interesting information about politics and, and how people from islands strategically play with voting and, and with the um, uh, elections as well. It's a very interesting subject, but if you're interested, you can ask me and we can talk about it later, maybe after the, the talk. Today is not about that, so in a way, I'll skip that. And just I mentioned the people on that island might look like they only do fishing, right? They do much more than that, they fish, but they also teach at the same time, they deal with the uh, tuna businesses, the directors of the business in the, in the Bagian. Bagian is the, the lines of houses. They go from the coast to the, the sea, with the Tompa, and the Caramba. So those are Bagian, and you can see that each Bagian is a family, right? And they are connected. I'll show you in a second with, with pictures. And there. And to see the Bagian, so this is part of the Bagian, for example. This is part, it's a tompa, it's part of the Bagian, the uh, traces back to the, the coast of the island. And um, obviously the Bagian has like arms, connects to bridges, to other houses, who are also families. So they are pretty organic. When family member dies, it's changed. When families have fights, they change the doors. They move the doors to the other side or to the front or to the back. So houses again and the structures that are supposed to be non-human, are human as well. They change with, with uh, kinship changes as well, so that's interesting. The, the badge of Nine Island, with whom I stayed for two years, have family in all these places. So they move a lot, they go a lot to all these places, um, by boat generally, or some planes or, or trains or buses. Um, they have family in Talise, in Banca, Talawan Bajo, Kima Bajo, Manado obviously, Arrakan, uh, Gorontalo, Tolitoli, and I skip the rest of Sulawesi, but there's many people in, in, in other parts of Sulawesi as well. And also Maluku. Ternate and Maluku. Um, um, so one of the things, after living in the island for, for two years, I tried to learn as much as I could about Bajo knowledge, Bajo sense of space, so how do people from small islands perceive the space, which also might, might sound obvious, but it's not as obvious as we think. At least it's not as similar to how we feel space as, as we think. Um, and I wanted to know about languages. What does the very notion of language mean for them, um, as opposed to as for us who teach languages or who teach linguistics or who study languages in informal settings? And, and I wanted to, to talk about identity as well. So what does it mean to be a Bajo? Because a, the, the word Bajo is an exonym. It's a name given by other people. So when you are on Nine Island, people don't talk about Bajo per se. They talk about Bajo when they are in Manado to show that they are Bajo. But in the island, you're already a Bajo. You're there. So you don't need to talk about these words. So these are exonyms. So what does it mean to be a Bajo really on the island? So I wanted to learn these things. In, in, 
Fahadi can explain a little bit better. In, in, um, in two years, you can learn so much. So well, as an anthropologist, you're always critical of how much you, you learn. And a lot of things are guided by your own bias and the things you think you, you learn or the things you think you understand, but they, they, they might be different. So we keep on uh, reflecting constantly about your, our own learning and challenging the things we think we know, in a way. Other disciplines don't do that so much, and, and that might suggest that we are insecure, in a way, because we do that, but I think it's a good exercise to keep on developing studies in, in different ways and, and going further and, and being aware of your own limitations as well. So, why, so after living on the island, I thought, right, all the literature that I've read, all the, all the, the research design that I prepared to come to Indonesia and, and study in Indonesia, small islands, has been highly heterocentric. And what does it mean to say heterocentric? So land-based, land-focused, made by a person who is from land, from a city, from land, from an urban space, to go and study an island in a non-urban space. So I was like, yeah, it doesn't really work. So most of the works that I, that I studied and that I brought with me from anthropology, from linguistics, from geography as well, from the environmental sciences as well, were highly terracentric. There's a pre <coughs> predominantly presence of terracentric researchers and, and people. And there has been for a while since the 2000s, 2010 onwards, more focus on the sea Acknowledging that you're focusing on the sea, obviously people studied the sea before in history, in linguistics, in, in, all, in all fields, in all disciplines and fields. But um, now there's a, there's, there's, there's a shift, it's a sort of shift in recognizing that some uh, studies need a more maritime focus. So they need to be studied in their own context, in their own fluid and dynamic context, and from a different perspective. Obviously, we're still terracentric because I, I can't be maritime just because I choose to be maritime from one day to the next. So we still keep our biases, but at least we can start focusing on studies that make sense, in a way. Um, one thing that um, brought me to Nine Island and also made me really upset after was media simplification of budget people. So in, when you see budget people in the media, what, do you, what can you think of? So when I say the budget, maritime people of Indonesia, you think of the BBC or, or Compass or whatever uh, magazines and, and newspapers you have in Indonesia, what do you think of? Folkloric people, right? In the sea, fishing, they're one with the sea, they're adapting to the sea and becoming fish almost. Very folkloric, very exotic. But that, that made me really upset. So I thought, all we can see immediate simplification, exotization of people, very biocentric approaches to people. So people change because their environment change, changes, so the sea changes, they have to adapt, so they don't have agency. So that made me like a little bit upset. I thought, why can't we acknowledge the agency of communities, people, cultures, um, in changing themselves as well? Does it have to be a, a nature of science changing? So that's a problem with the with budget and maritime communities, the media and, and mainstream scholarship as well sometimes, outside the maritime humanities, tends to assume the environments are fluid and change, but humans don't unless the environment makes them change. And obviously they change from both sides and they both um, influence each other, but it's more complex than that. Another thing that I looked at is the, the conservation industry in Indonesia, especially in the Bunak and Taman Nacional, in which um, there's also highly biocentric. Ooh, what's happening here? Okay, this dies every now and then. I might need my helper, must ball near me all the time. Yeah, you want to sit by the piano? Yes. <laughs> so, oops, we'll go there. Um, conservation industry and environmental studies, both are quite bio biocentric. They assume a, a fluid environment that changes. So geology, biology, that changes constantly. Ecology, that changes constantly. But the social part of the ecology is fixed, unless it changes because the environment changes. So this is sort of, in broad terms and in very general terms and simplifying terms, so I'm, I'm now doing what I criticize media does. This is what you see when you talk about marathon communities. And this is something I didn't believe gave people enough room to show their own agency in a way, so I thought, okay. And then when we go to social studies, like anthropology, for example, cultural anthropology, social anthropology, or political science, or, or any other um, social sciences, and we see a lot of the opposite. So the social constantly moves, but the environment doesn't. 
There's a fixed environment, but the social moves around. Still limited, right? Both systems move. Both are part of the same system, actually, or similar connected systems, so what's happening there? And what I said just a little bit earlier, now, increasingly, more, especially historians, more people from the humanities and the social sciences, because anthropology is also social sciences, both humanities and social sciences, are starting to focus on the agency of the sea, maritime history. And when I say starting, I mean on paper, on books, on documents, on institution, within institutions, and in the Netherlands and the UK. I don't mean other countries like Australia, maybe, or the US. I'm, not, uh, I'm familiar with that, but I'm, today I'm talking more about the UK and, and the Netherlands, which is what I studied and where I work. So in the Netherlands and in the UK, there's uh, increasingly more focus on um, maritime history, maritime cultures, maritime languages, calling them like that. Before people studied them already, but um, not per se putting them together. So, must fall. <laughs> Is there anything I can do with this? Yeah, there. So, um, just to talk briefly about my own research, before I continue with the maritime humanities, um, the big overall broad question that I had with me, for my research and I still carry with me today, is can different environmental paradigms, so different ideas of the environment, different ideas of nature, coexist on a small island, like Nine Island? And yes, they, they can. And are these different environmental paradigms, the different ideas of nature, brought in through different languages? Yes. But as Indonesia has a, an idea of alam, nature, that is completely different from the nature of Baosama. In Baosama, there's no word for nature. Nature means sort of, I mean, this again in, in broad, simplified terms, means space, and space includes the human as well. So there's no nature in third person that you need to protect yourself against or manage. You still manage and protect yourself, but you're part of it. So it's a, it's, a, it's a different concept, in a way. So different languages, small, big languages, it doesn't matter. Introduce, I mean, it matters in, in the sense that they have more power or less, in a way, but they introduce different ideas of nature, or different ideas of the environment. And that is the main overall question that I had when I did my field work, my, my research, and a question that I still carry with me now, somehow. But before I bore everybody from the Bajo community, I will continue. And so I looked at the alliances of Bahas Indonesia, Madra Malay, and Maosama in conveying these different ideas of nature to understand. I mean, this is useful for environmental policy makers, conservation, industry as well, and social sciences, and humanities, anyone studying um, human culture and environment as well, obviously. So where do we fit this theme, this topic, where do we fit it? In humanities, in social sciences, maritime humanities. It could be a, a way of giving a context, in a sense. To, am I moving? You see me? Yeah. OK, so before we talk about the maritime humanities more, I wanted to briefly mention the environmental humanities, which is a, a field of study that is more popular in, in the Netherlands and in the UK. And not so popular either, not so prominent either, but it's been there for a while. And it basically means studying the environment again, so-called nature, from a humanities perspective. So you study the environment from the perspective of literature, literature, so any works, any, any poems, anything written about the environment, okay? It could be in Indonesia, in different languages. You study the environment from a philosophic perspective as well. That could fit with me somehow. Um, you study the environment from a historical perspective. It can be colonial history, as they always like to do in Leiden, or it could be post-colonial. It could be contemporary history as well. So we move beyond the colonial as well. And environmental anthropology. So you can study the environment from an anthropology, anthropological perspective, which means that you look at how the environment is socially constructed in different contexts, OK? So I quite like the environmental humanities. It is a flexible, open field. And you can study the environment from many different perspectives. But nowadays, in the Netherlands, yeah, in the Netherlands, um, it's mainly done with literature studies. So literature and environment. That's more popular now in the Netherlands. Not so much from the uh, anthropological perspective, and not so much from any of the other perspectives. So 
what I wanted to mention, for example, the University of Amsterdam, one of the two, two or three, there might be more, but one of the two main universities in Amsterdam has an environmental humanity center, which is quite interesting. You can search the, the website later. Uh, it was easy, I can send you the PowerPoint. If you're interested in the slides, you can share the slides uh, with people. And uh, they have an, an interesting project. They do reading groups, they do courses, everything. But they focus on environmental studies from an environmental scientist perspective, let's call it, and, and literature, so literary studies. And there's a, as well as you, what's this guy? Has it died? Yeah. But can you hear me anyways? Sort of? Yeah? Oh, sorry, the second one. Ah. Yeah. Okay, yeah, good. I might need a third one. <laughs> if it's nice again, okay. Un guiperlo ya en que diga, ¿no? Ok, so, um, there's also a university in, in the Netherlands that has some environmental humanity programs and they teach environmental humanities and they research, they have a research unit on environmental humanities in Wageningen. And there's this colleague of mine whose work I really like. She's a, an environmental anthropologist. She studied at Leiden University, but she works in, she's an assistant professor in Wageningen now. And she does a, a lot of interesting research in Indonesia. So if you have the chance to read her work, she's uh, been in the Maluku Strait, and she did work with Bajo, but also with conservationists and with uh, foreign scientists, together with Bajo and, and, and foreign scientists, in, Ma in Makassar, the Makassar Strait, and also Kalimantan. So she's been there, so check um, the work if you're interested in, in environmental work from an anthropological perspective in Indonesia, but I'm not promoting here anything, so just uh, in your free time. Okay, so why study the environment from a humanities perspective? Well. Many reasons. You can move away from the biocentric focus that the environmental sciences have. You can try to move away from that. Uh, you can combine everything through connectivity. So the connectivity ontology is a very common perspective in the environmental humanities. What it means, in, in, in lay terms, is that everything is connected. That everything exists connected. So the environment, uh, the, the things that we assume are non-human, and the human are all connected. They are part of the same machinery, like say pieces of the same machinery or whatever metaphor you want to make. Um, there's also a notion of technological justice. Technological? Ecological justice. What's happening? I arrived last night all the way from Netherlands, so forgive me if I'm like, uh, yeah, Dylan. Uh, so ecological justice. So what does ecological justice mean? Balance, basically. So whatever balance each ecology has, and needs, in a way. So it can be very relative, depending on where you are. And um, humans and non-humans are part of ecological justice. So if you look at environmental humanities, you include the human end, and then it's easier to talk about justice of any kind. And there's also the issue of actors, so actors, people. So if you want to talk about an environment, like an island, a small island, you need to include the islanders, obviously. You're not just gonna talk about the, you can talk about the sea, of course, and, and and um, remains that you find there from history. You can, you can talk about um, different ecosystems, different animals, anything. But people are also part of it. So in, you can include different voices, different people, academics, experts, like Bahaji, for example. But you can also include non-academic experts, who are also experts of bio knowledge and, and culture, or any knowledge and culture you're interested in. So non-academics, are also experts. And I think it's important to, to move beyond the hegemony of technocratic knowledge that we all like so much. Also in Europe, we, we love this. <laughs> At the university, we love to say that we are experts and we work with experts and we are all legitimized. But there's a lot of people who know a lot and we don't take into account. So I think it's important to, 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 to use. So this is increasingly becoming more popular in the environmental humanities um, and that's interesting. Um, move beyond. Um, Linear and non-linear approaches to the environment, so there's approaches from A to B, but also around A and B, so moving beyond different um, approaches. And in a way, I mean, this I learned on, on an island, I, it might sound obvious as well, but it's less obvious than it sounds. Um, things go around a lot. Things go around a lot. So the social flows a lot. So when I talk about Nine Island, I have to also talk about all these other places. So the place called island, Pulau Kechi, is not so Kechi, no? 
it moves around. So you, you talk about kinship, you talk about family, and you need to talk about all these other places as well. So the, 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 the so-called island is much bigger, expands, moves, depending on relationships and kinship. So beyond the idea of place and space, it's limited to here, right now. But we are all people with our histories and with our connections. So place and space also dynamic. This is a very anthropological thing to say, so forgive me, but, but considering things like that, going forward, yeah. Okay. This doesn't like me. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes. So the environmental humanities and the social sciences. Again, I go back to the reflection that I shared, um, saying that can we really separate the humanities and the social sciences? Difficult. Difficult to separate. Things that, like in my own studies in linguistic anthropology will fall in both social science and the humanities. So. Can, do we really need to separate ourselves from other? I think all faculties are connected in a way, but especially social sciences and humanities, and especially if you search and um, research the environment in, in, in social ways. So then you, you travel across these, these uh, faculties and disciplines. And um, there's th different um, crossing axioms, which basically means paths that cross between these two um, faculties, humanities and social sciences. Um, and it's the ecosystem, in the sense of the studying the environment, obviously, is the ecosystem laws, for example, which um, started in the social sciences, in, in politics, but also crossed to, to humanities as well. I'm not going to talk too much about this, because it might be boring. Um, the ecological kinship that I mentioned earlier, which moves around and changes constantly. And this is a very anthropological idea of the space being constructed. And the connects to the third, so social construction ecosystems, the ecological unity, again. So a kind of anthropological thing, which is from the social sciences, but also from the humanities. So how are things constructed through language as well? And it's language is humanity, so again, we can't really delineate these um, boundaries. And I think that's a good thing. I think that is a good thing, actually. Well, okay, Lim limitations and challenges. Um, main limitations and challenges are the small presence, um, basically, in the, and I'm not sure, I mean, I want to hear from yourselves, whether the, the, the maritime humanities and the environmental humanities are present in Indonesia. And you'll be, I, I mean present, I know you all study maritime humanities already, but I mean institutionalized, in the sense of uh, research networks, uh, research fora, perhaps, um, teaching in, in, in programs that you teach, whether you teach maritime studies or maritime history or maritime anything, environmental um, studies. And, and in the Netherlands and in the UK, not so much. It's not so, so popular, but it's becoming more prominent now, in a way. Um, environmental humanities, I guess, is, is mainly focused on literary studies. There's more things to add to it than that. And it's still, environmental humanities, still terra centric, and ur urban centric, again. Um, and again, when we talk about fields like the environmental humanities and the, and the maritime humanities, there's so many disciplines involved that you don't really have one methodological approach or one theoretical framework to apply to all the studies and research you do, and that's what people might understand as vague, not valid, no um, legitimacy, these questions as well, as well, non reliable, but it doesn't mean that really, it's just diverse in a sense. But some people in the scientific community have this idea that if you don't have, in the environmental sciences, if you don't have a methodological approach that everybody shares and improves and tests and proves, you're not really strong as a field of study. And that's again a, an academic paradigm that these disciplines have, so it doesn't mean really anything in a way. But that has been legitimized and has been established as a valid way of researching scientifically. And that's why the environmental humanities and the maritime humanities might sound less scientific. But it's just a construction again. As an anthropologist, we can sort of suggest that um, it's just constructed socially, depending on who's in power and what disciplines attract more funding, etc., etc. So we can talk about politics of academia after. Um, but the maritime humanities, that's why I'm here. Half an hour through my talk, or more or less, and I still haven't spoken about much about the maritime humanities. So I'm not sure when it started precisely, because it, it, there's also maritime humanities in the US and, and many other countries, obviously, and in Indonesia as well. But um, people are starting to talk about it now in the Netherlands as an emerging field. Whoa, an emerging field. But obviously people have been researching maritime topics for a long, long time in, from different perspectives. So it's not a new thing, 
the newly institutionalized listing. So there's a really nice book that I reviewed for um, a journal in the Netherlands, and it's called in the title History of Southeast Asia by Gaynor, Jennifer, Jennifer Gaynor, I think. It was published in 2016, and she, I think she's one of the first maritime historians, I think she's from the US, I can't remember, and might be wrong, but um, she's one of the first maritime historians who the, um, talks about colonial history of Indonesia and Southeast Asia in general, focusing on the sea and, and, the, and the, the power and dynamics, power dynamics as well of people of the sea. And she mentioned the Buginese, the Bajo, and she mentions obviously the Dutch, the colonial administration, the Dutch, the Portuguese, all these colonial um, entities who came from, from Europe, and mentions the, the different wars, the Spice War, many other wars, the Ambon Wars. And, but I think she does something that others haven't done before so well. She, she gives people like the Bajo, who weren't mentioned at all, sometimes in history books, pages and pages and pages of archival material in which um, they have collaborated and not collaborated with Dutch administration and they have strategically gone against different people because they have the knowledge of the sea, they have knowledge of navigation, they have expertise and people needed that expertise at the time. So they, they deal, they deal differently with different people and also deal differently with the Buginese. There was a lot of power dynamics between the Buginese and the Bajo um, in terms of um, power but also in terms of knowledge identity, there were a lot of uh, dynamics there, so it's nothing new, in a way. But for the first time, you see it in a book, present, quite present, and I like, I mean, she still, we still look at it from a heliocentric perspective, which it was typical of European countries, who studied non-European countries, but she does a good job, I think, so it's interesting if, if you want to read, no promoting again, so no need to buy it, but um, get it from Google PDF, or whatever. And um, there's also, um, this is in the UK as well, yeah. So there's also some centers. So this is, uh, the link here is a work history again, so maritime history, uh, published in the Netherlands just now, I think last year, 2018, I think, or this year. And it's again history from 1400 to 1800 only. So if you know interest in history, no way, but then again focusing on the sea, cultures of the sea then. So looking at the colonial archives from a completely different perspective, in a way still look uh, by people who are from the Netherlands, but, but giving focus to different people. And, and now we come to, to another uh, prominent branch or sub-branch or whatever you want to call it of, of maritime uh, humanities, which is classics and archaeology. So I just uh, randomly put a link here to a conference, I think it was a conference, yeah, conference that took place um, in Newcastle, I think, in the north of England, and it had to do with professionals, academics, students from archaeology, but also history and other classic uh, disciplines who, who went there and presented their work and then they started networking. It just, it just happened last year or this year, so they're pretty new. And they're starting to, to, to do this. There's also, in the Netherlands, there's also the MARE conference, which is about the sea, but it's highly environmental, environmentally scientific. So it's, it's environmental studies from a scientific perspective, the sciences, the maritime sciences but not so much the humanities. And now the uh, people from the humanities and social sciences are starting to go to these conferences and talk about their own research. So I think it's quite interesting in that sense. And then just around, I mean, these links I pick randomly. I don't know anyone from here. I don't have friends or family here. So it, it's just randomly you can search online as well. Exeter University in, in the UK, in the south of England, has a department of maritime humanities, which is very rare. For, but they have a very uh, extensive history of, of um, navigation and maritime studies there. So it, it sort of makes sense in the place. But not so present in the UK despite being an island. Huh? The UK is an island as well, but not so present. Only in the south and, yeah, somehow. And, and the, the Shetlands and the north in the islands. And, and also not so present in the Netherlands, which is also a country that is highly maritime, right? Especially invading and, and, and colonizing. But, um, interesting how uh, different faculties and different fields of study don't make it so prominently because of the politics of academia in a way. And now I need mass poll again. <laughs> and yes, yeah, so it's an interesting emerging field in which um, academics of any discipline can, can, can participate. Not so, not so prominent, but starting to, 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 to be legitimized and institutionalized in the, in the UK and in the Netherlands. And I want to hear about Indonesia later. Um, 
The limitations and challenges of the Martian humanities, many, 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 many that I haven't included, but um, some things to focus. So far, because it includes history, mainly, historical accounts of Martian cultures during the colonial period, it has a highly focused on colonial and post-colonial accounts, which come from archives, written by whom? The same type of people, I mean same. Not the same, but similar type of people. So there's a high colonial bias on those works because the type of archives you read are gonna be from colonial administration, obviously. So where are the other voices there? Some voices were oral, they were written, so they are not on the archives. So we need to be critical of these type of studies if we want to decolonize academia and, and make it more coherent around the world and also in Spain and in other countries, not just in the Netherlands, so yeah, this is interesting. And again, rarely presents contemporary studies, which I think doing contemporary research for people who are alive now, and environments who are alive now, can also work against the colonial bias, because you're focusing on new people, real people who exist now, in certain ways, in different ways, and then they, can, they have their own voices. You don't give voices to people, they have their own voices. You might understand them, or not, <laughs> or make statements on their behalf, they are not really their statements, but people already have voices. We just need to include them in academia. There's a, there's a need to include different people in academia. Still maritime studies, terracentric. Still focus on, on made by people like us, who come from the urban cities or capitals or, or academia. Also people coming from villages. Very little people who come, very few, uh, sorry, little, few people, they, they might be tall, not, not just little people, but uh, some people, they, came from, they come from maritime and islands, mar maritime environments and small islands, are not so present there, but there's increasingly more people participating in research who are island people and sea people, and I think that's really interesting. Another limitation is it's so far limited to anglophone audiences, like I am doing right now, anglo anglo anglicizing things, because because of many reasons. I mean, academia scholarship at the moment in Europe is dominated by the English as a language. Um, as a linguist, I think uh, there should be many more languages included. I don't think we should focus on one language. If no, we can learn other languages, okay. I mean, that's a different uh, discussion, but that can also limit you in a way that you're only reading the work of certain people by certain people with certain perspectives. So, should maritime humanities include Baosama? Yep. Should maritime humanities include any other sea languages? Yeah. And again, this is complex, obviously. There's more discussions to be had and to, in terms of publications. Can we publish in Bausala? No, it's not a language to publish articles, obviously. But we can sort of challenge this a little bit. And I'm not doing that myself, so I apologize by presenting in English. Um, but what about the maritime humanities in Indonesia? Do they exist? I mean, we have all the maritime humanities where there's colleagues here from, from Italy who are experts in, in archaeology, maritime studies, mar uh, maritime languages as well, and they do maritime studies already from humanities perspective, and, and there's also myself and there's other people. We've been doing this for a long time, for 30 years, for 7 years, for 10 years, but we haven't been sort of networking as much with each other and we haven't been institutionalized as much. So it would be great if universities here in the Netherlands, in the UK, in Italy, in other countries had maritime humanities departments, environmental humanities departments maybe, and we think it's maritime humanities departments or separate, independent, and um, oops, where people, sorry, where people could um, come and work and also non-academic people who are experts could also come and work and in different languages, that would be great. Um, so Indonesia is, is the, one of the, most, the I think, the highest um, linguistic, uh, linguistic, linguistically diverse country in, in the world. I think, or one of the, the, the biggest uh, in that sense. So, and it's full of small islands, which make it easier for people to come in <laughs> and study um, more details to, to, to provide a more holistic account in, in short time. So it makes it more more accessible. Um, and there's a very political ecology around, like in all countries, in a way, but differently in Indonesia. There's a lot of ecological systems that are in constant change, and, and both human and non-human, obviously. And there's a very political element to it, so um, different people from different islands play with their own identity politically. They, they perform this uh, performative identity they have for the public. There's, a, there's also more private identity, more personal, that is kept on the island. And when I say the island, I mean also the place of the island travels, not just 
that island. Um, and there's a lot of environmental knowledge of different kinds by different people. Um, there's also non-hegemonic perspectives to humanity and the environment, and I think we need that. Not that, not that they need us, that we need that in academia, I think, to move beyond all the, the other biases that we have. And I think it would be great to start doing this, I mean, it's probably already present, but not uh, institutionalized, but it would be great to start doing this through collaboration, through collaboration between universities, foreign universities, or national universities in Indonesia, and local universities in Indonesia. So, for example, Universitas Indonesia, of course, um, UGM, um, San Ratulangi, Manado, any university can have people working with whoever comes from a, um, abroad and is interested in topics. And I think collaboration is, is a key aspect of, of it. And of course, that, that could lead to decolonizing research in academia, in and outside Indonesia, obviously, and about and for Indonesia, both, that can help. And I'm going to give, to bore you more, even more, I'm going to give um, a few examples from my own research, um, which I sort of place now in the Mar Maritime Humanities and Social Sciences, but it could be anywhere. Um, island. And these are three theoretical stances. I call theoretical stances because they are not mine. They are mine also, but they are not mine. They are, they are by the people of the island. So people of Dine Island also produce theory. They also produce environmental theory. Whether you understand it or not, that's not their fault, obviously. And we might assume that this is not environmental theory because it's not scientifically correct, because we can't test it. And you can obviously test it in different ways, but we can't do it in, in that scientific method way. But these three things, three things that I learned while I was on the island about the environment, the so-called nature, that is human and non-human, there's no dichotomy of the human and the non-human, is that the environment knows you first. So to achieve environmental knowledge, to get to know the, the island, the sea, the fish, fishing, to get to learn and know all these things, they have to know you first, right? So to, to you all it probably sounds like what? <laughs> That's, that's what I was thinking for. I was like, oh, but how does the environment know you? Do you need to talk to fish? Do you need to talk to the trees? Do you need to go like, like a gila around the island talking to, to everything? No, you don't. I mean, I tried, but you don't do that. I mean, what you do in, as a bajo and, and in Pulau Nain to, to, to be known by the environment is be there, right? So you're there, you're present, and you're there in the way that they are there. Not in your way. I can go there and do tourism, or okay, I can live there for two years and I can just not be knowledgeable about the environment. So you have to prove skills. And to prove um, skills, which is super important in Bajo culture, different Bajo cultures are completely different, but this is common in a way, you have to prove that you are mampu. Mampu. You can gather influence from other people. You have your networks within the island. You can, you can when you need it, you can gather in contacts. And you can get from rice to political influence. You can get many things from that. And, and by showing that ability to, to build networks with people from the island, or from all the places that the island goes, you start showing that you have knowledge, that you belong, that you're a bio, and then um, enter daily life. And in daily life is when more knowledge about the environment is sort of unpacked, right? And it's unpacked through things like talking about how hot you are. So you keep saying, Panascal, oh, Panascal, Panastimurini, oh, Panascal. And you might think that people are just being funny talking about how hot they are because they gossip, no? But it's not. They're, they're telling you where the wind comes from and what kind of fish will come. And by unpacking this knowledge, you can know a lot about the sea already, the type of species that will come in what direction, and then you can set your boats to sail. You can also do things in the in the in the, the fields and the mountain. You can do things in different places. So it's not just about the sea because everything is included, but there's a lot of knowledge that goes through things like uh, talking about how hot you are. But if you just listen to the literal meaning of being hot, you just di dismiss that knowledge because you don't think it tells you anything other than the person being hot. And you think, oh, these islanders, so funny with the, uh, how hot they feel. But no, there's more to it. So we need to de-exoticize what we think of other people. <coughs> from smaller places that might look small, but they're pretty big. And we need to start understanding what they are telling you through the daily life conversations. These daily life um, conversations that might look um, irrelevant or not interesting, but they are. There's more knowledge. So through these conversations is how you acquire knowledge. You're there, so you, you're participating in these conversations, you're understanding them, starting to understand them. 
and then you start to acquire knowledge that is produced through these relationships. And again, fish are there as well, so they listen to you. And they know you're hot from the east, and they know you know they're coming, and they allow you to, to, to catch them. That's how it works. So to be a good fisherman, by your fisherman, you can't take the fish for stupid. You, can, you need to show that you're relevant and competent, and then they allow you to fish. To fish you. So they allow you this allow, there's an agency that comes from the fish as well. So human and non-human connected. So there is not just one um, part of the, the ecosystem, the, the island. And um, the world outside, as we perceive it, the budget would not, would not say the world outside because they are the world and the world is theirs as well. And it's, they are part of the world, that's what I mean. And perceives you as well and articulates knowledge through you. So this is something abstract when it comes out of nowhere, random, suddenly I present this. But this is a, a product of two years, trying to understand how people perceive themselves and, and knowledge and the, and the island in itself. And then, the way I studied the environment, the way I studied environmental knowledge on Nine Island had um, methodological implications as well. So it's not just the theory, the environmental theory that is produced on the island by the Bajo, and the one I try to understand, and I probably translate in the wrong ways, but yeah. Um, but also methodological implications that can be applied to the, the field of maritime uh, humanities, and also environmental humanities, obviously. And it's also closer here. Oh, great. Um, I can talk uh, through here. So one of the, the implications is called positionality. Positionality. So it's where you position yourself, which is, positionality is, is pretty big in anthropology. People discuss a lot about positionality. Oh, yes. They spend days and days, they spend chapters and chapters talking about positionality. In linguistics as well, increasingly more so now, not so much before. And basically it means the impact of your own biases, <coughs> the impact of your own understandings of your linguistic limitations and your linguistic competences as well, it's also positive in a way. And, and the choices you make. So it's mainly about the choices you make to collect certain type of data that influences the analysis, obviously, of the data. So if you choose not to collect this informatica and panacea, then you're not collecting that type of knowledge. So it's the choices you make. Um, there's also increasingly more focus on the type of power relations the languages have when they bring different ideas of the environment. So different ideas, so when the Bajo speaking in Bazaar, Manaru Malay, they talk about things differently. Obviously, people talk about things differently when they speak in Malay. And then on the same day, they talk differently about things when they speak in Bahas, Indonesia, about alarm and, and, and disasters, and all these programs that come from Jakarta, you not know, to, to, to protect the island from tsunami, which has never happened there. <laughs> but they think it might be, and they make signs on the island uh, so that people can run to the, the mountain, but then there's never been a tsunami there. Anyways, yeah, I mean, people are, um, in environmental sciences and environmental policy, people tend to go to places that they predefine based on their own simplification. I mean, not their own simplification as people who are simple, but based on media simplification, based on um, a scholarship that simplifies communities and, and places. And they assume that's what they need, that's what people need, but they don't look into more than that. So we move our, uh, beyond that and, and know that every day, Environment can be talked about in many different ways on the same five square kilometer island. It's a tiny island. You can talk about the environment in three different ways or more on one day. So the power relation between languages, majority languages, minority languages, they're all together every day. And what kind of paradigms they bring, what kind of information and knowledge they bring in certain places. So I think it's important to focus on that as well. And again, non-biocentric approaches. So we move beyond methodologically as well to look for different methods that help us move, move away from terracentric and biocentric approaches. So one method, for example, would be to, to focus on feeling. What you feel, sensorial experiences, and include that as a methodology, why not? Why not study the way we feel, or, you know, the, the sensorial experiences we have, the things we see in different ways? That can be a methodology as well. Um, Islands, in a linguistic sense, because I also do linguistics, and obviously in, you can separate language from culture, so it's all, all, all connected and embedded. Um, islands in Indonesia, especially um, in the north of Indonesia, Pulau Nai, for example, are very is, special linguascapes. So the linguascapes of these islands, the, 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 the seascape, the linguascape, um, are very complicated. So you need to understand that first before you go for any knowledge 
of environment or, or social life, anything. And I think that can benefit um, the humanities and the social sciences as well. Um, yeah, I mean, and, and ultimately it's all about the need to acknowledge the, the problematic of trying to fit an island or a mar maritime place of, in people with intercentric models. Can we fit maritime languages, like Mount Sama, with models that have been created for English maybe, or for, I don't know, for Scottish or for any other language? Well, for Scottish probably closer, but not so much for, for other languages. Do we need different models, different linguistic models, different methodologies to research language? Same can be applied to culture, obviously, and anything. And they go beyond these other models, so we need to be a little bit critical in that sense. Some self-promotion uh, now. If you're gonna be, I mean, I'm gonna finish soon, so that we can discuss together. So you can ask me questions after, and we can discuss. But um, tomorrow we're leaving for Semarang, and I'm giving another two talks. If you're interested, if anyone is in Semarang, and I'm gonna talk at Universidad de Anus Guantoro on the sixth uh, to um, Nam Pukujam Itu, um, and it's about languages. So language vitality in in Indonesia, and it's in the Department of Linguistics and Translation. Um, there. And then the next day I'm in Universidad Tipo Negoro in Samarang and, and I'm going to talk about methods, so ethnographic methods in, in the study of the environment and politics, so in a way, political ecology, in a way. And, but, yeah. Okay, so Trima Casi Semuanya, and I wanted to say if you have any comments, any questions, any comments, any ideas, anything, that's my email at Leiden. Um, you can send me emails, you, uh, you can also request the PowerPoint. If Cecilia can send it or I can send it as well, if you want some more detail about some of the works or, or, or information. And um, yeah, welcome for anything. And thank you for your patience <laughs> with the, the English that I just uh, spilled. That's it, yeah, that's it. Thank you so much. I work um, in Kaimana Regency in West Papua province. And um, I'm basically a coastal ecologist, so it's, it's more on the environmental oh, point of view. Scientist, <laughs> so it's really mind-blowing to see uh, um, wow. additional, uh, what you call it, parameters that uh, we environmental scientists need to, to carry on. Um, I, th I think that within the climate, uh, what you call it, society now, we, we kind of see that back in the days, um, uh, nature kind of, kind of, kind of decides how, how human survives. And I think now humans kind of determine how, how nature thrives, I may say. So I think my, my question, based on your findings from the social anthropology point of view, what's, what's sort of the, the, the key findings for, for us, especially uh, coming from a environmental background, need to consider to, to see whether uh, this kind of approach could be a positive change or a negative change uh, to the environment uh, more on coastal um, ecosystem. And I think um, uh, a follow-up on that, if, 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 if you can really share to us what the key finding and, and whether that could be included in some kind of ecosystem valuation kind of approach for that to be also accounted apart from the bio biophysical parameters. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Humanities, social sciences, um, um, scientists can benefit from each other. I mean, they, they should work together. I mean, that is my, my idea. They should work together and, and benefit from each other the way the, the different disciplines and different methodologies view the same so called places in a way. And also, if, if anthropologists work on their own all the time, they're going to miss things, obviously. So, everybody misses things. It's not just the, 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 the environmental scientists, obviously. Um, but um, in a way, the findings, so in anthropology you don't really have findings at the end. So you, you write a thesis which answers the question or sub questions that, that you post. It challenges everything, that's positionality exercises, that's all these things around. And it tells you in the end that um, the place is different or the people that you, you study with are different and, and you need to challenge this idea that this division, for example, that the environment changes you and you change the environment, is always both. And maybe in, the, in context like Nine Island, if you were to go there and study climate change, for example, you will have to, you can do it from your scientific parameters, but you will have to also stop and do it from a social perspective in which you take into account their knowledge system. So before you even talk about the environment, they start to understand how knowledge is produced. Any knowledge. Knowledge of polit politics, knowledge of anything. And gossip is also a kind of knowledge. So how, how are things produced? How, are th how do things travel around the island every day? And also consider not just the island, but a place that is in constant flux to other 
uh, islands and, 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 and seas and, and non-urban and non, non places. And um, to, 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 to challenge that idea of place already, for a scientist, is a big thing that takes a long time and a number of exercises. Because in science, in the natural sciences, place, as a geologist, when I study geology, place moves and it's very dynamic, it's fluid, but it's not really an island, it's just an island, that island. But it's not. So in a way, there's so much for, to exercise from both sides, in a way. So I think um, the main findings that I, if I had to put findings in, uh, things into findings, fit things into findings, would be that, that environmental knowledge is, is starts in the environment, in the non-human, so-called non-human, and, and also looks back at you in a way. So it's not just a human production. Um, but obviously I'm telling you as a human, and by human people, so it, 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 it's complicated to explain. But yeah, knowledge, and environmental knowledge in this case, it starts outside of the so-called human, and also the idea that this dichotomy of the human and the non-human doesn't exist in some places. That would be one of the, the things. Um, if we trace back at this dichotomy of nature and the human, we can go back to the Enlightenment in, in, in Europe and how science was, uh, was science back then was um, dissected into the, the before it was natural humanities in a way, but then it moved into science, science and, and humanities, let's say. So the division of the, the soul and the, the mind in a way. But we, I, mean, I was going to say we are not Europeans, but I am. <laughs> I am European, so that's going to dictate my philosophies and the way I think about things, but if I step out of that and I see myself as, as my own research, and I see my own cultural background, and I see my own biases, as I do see the others, then that's an oppositionality exercise. So that's something that maybe, but I can't imagine a climate scientist doing that. Can you imagine a climate scientist, but you're doing it already, so yeah, I can imagine that, but saying, right, I am a climate, a climate scientist, and I see nature in this way because my discipline has this paradigm <laughs> that I've learned, and now I see only I see nature only in this way, and I need to step out from that. That's not going to happen. It will happen privately, in thinking and reflecting in conversations. But to be institutionalized, complicated and complicated because these models come from Europe, especially and, and the U.S. and then Western countries and. In Indonesia, per se, it didn't have that before, but now it has it. I mean, obviously, Indonesia is also very urban, urbanized, and, and very um, terra-centric sometimes. So despite being an, an, an archipelago, in the way academia is being produced, it's still pretty city-centered, in a way. So that, that's something. But you can be aware of these things. You can reflect, you can position yourself, you can position others. So there's ways of doing things like that, no, I guess. But I, can't, I really can't see any geologist or climate scientist or telling their colleagues even, they will laugh, no? they will be like, yeah, sure, the, anthrop and the anthropologists are crazy, just don't listen to them. But yeah, I mean, the steps to, to start working, I think if there was a Maritime Humanities Institute, so imagine, everybody, for example, a Maritime Humanities Institute in, in Universities Indonesia, where climate scientists work with social anthropologists, or with any other scientists, or with, with archaeologists, or with linguists, with anyone, and they had daily, daily weekly seminars, you know, conferences, events, where they discuss things, eventually they might come to, <laughs> to these positionality exercises. And, but we need spaces to do that. Because academia these days is very it's politicized, highly everywhere, in Europe as well, highly politicized, and, and the, the hierarchies of knowledges are so strict that sometimes you, you can do much with things. So we need spaces to develop these projects, to, to develop these discussions, the, these reflections. And I think the maritime humanities could be a space to do things like that, I hope. Even though it might be eventually highly um, environmental, environmentally scientificized or whatever we say, because it's the environment, but yeah, we could we could challenge that in a way. But thank you so much for, for the question. I hope I answered in some way. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, any other comments or, yeah. Uh, thank you for uh, the nice words that you said about uh, my university, but unfortunately it's not as no. nice as you were uh, uh, depicting. Yes. This is basically just the idea of uh, persons from two different disciplines who decided that uh, it's interesting to do some work and this is what we uh, actually started, collaborating actually with the uh, University of Indonesia. So trying to see uh, problems related to a maritime community from different perspectives. So I'm together with an archaeologist who's looking at the very archaeological point of view and then looking more to the linguistic and probably cultural side. So we haven't really started. My experience uh, is uh, basically on other issues. I understand all, the, all your discussion about uh, this new field that probably has to be um, 
has to be really thought about in university. And I have two really very general questions. One is uh, about what actually you do from this perspective in Leiden, really uh, materially. Because yes, yes. we can say that in Napoli we do that, but as a matter of fact, it's only myself and Chiara for this. Yes. Uh, <laughs> This particular thing, uh, and um, and also uh, based on your experience, I mean, it was very interesting that you were making all this discussion about uh, this new field. But uh, I haven't really seen what you've done in the field as yes. a linguist, yes. as a social anthropologist, as a cultural yeah. anthropologist, and probably you say you also have some knowledge of uh, geology. Yeah, well, it's a long story. So thank you, thank you so much. That's it. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. I'm interested yeah. also to know, yes. because you said that uh, in Leiden it's uh, under the Southeast Asian uh, Studies uh, program, which is very much a kind of area studies. Area studies. And in Leiden, I think it's quite uh, a lot mm -hmm. in area studies. Yes. But I really want to know, in your own um, uh, experience, experience, what is uh, actually, what do you do with the other colleagues, basically? Yes. This is yes. what. Yes. I didn't want to talk so much about myself because I thought it might um, bored everybody. I thought the field was more interesting, so I mentioned a few examples from, from the Netherlands and the UK. But so in Leiden, in the, the department I am is area studies, which is regional studies, and they have a pretty fixed idea of regions as well. Also very terra centric, biocentric, and, and social centric, whatever we want to call it. So they divide Asia um, in the Middle East. So Middle East and Asia are the two main focuses of the department, and then they divide Asia in East Asia. China studies, which for some reason is separated from East Asia, and then Southeast Asia, South Asia, and that's it. Again, area studies, I feel, is struggling. It's been struggling for a while in academia because it's too limited to these regional definitions and descriptions, and, and Asia flows much more. So, so it's experiencing these challenges. Within area studies, what I do is teach a lot, so there's barely any time for, for research, but I haven't done much uh, maritime humanities in, in the UK or, or in the Netherlands. What, what, I'm, what I've been doing is joining conferences on environmental um, studies from a humanities perspective and maritime topics and giving talks within the conferences, networking, and what I wanted to do now within area studies in Leiden is start a network of maritime humanities within the Leiden University. But you have to apply for funding, you have to do a lot of paperwork for that, and I'm starting to sort of promote this idea of having an institute, um, but it doesn't exist. So what I've done is my own thing within anthropology before in the UK when I did the field work in Indonesia, and, and before that within linguistics, um, and now in Leiden, more in a sense of creating networks so that maybe in the future there will be a maritime humanities institute within Leiden University, but this takes a, a long time. So. Um, what I did, so in anthropology, when I did um, my PhD in social anthropology in the UK and I came here to the fieldwork, I struggled to, to find myself in anthropology. I mean, I do find myself in within the discipline of anthropology, but I needed so much more than that. I needed linguistics, I needed so many other disciplines, and I was studying the environment. So that's how I started thinking I'm, I'm more of an environmental hum humanist or social scientist. And now the environment of humanities also felt limited in the sense that it's very terracentric. So I felt, oh no, maybe trying to find myself. This is more like a, like a self-conscious exercise, in a way, academically. And now I thought, okay, the maritime linguist and uh, humanity seem more, uh, and social sciences seem more like a space for me to develop, in a way, because it's very present there. So um, the only the examples I mentioned um, about from maritime humanities are many conferences, conferences, meetings, couple of uh, works that have been published, but uh, only one of them is under the Maritime Humanities title, which is the history book from 14 uh, to 1800 uh, in the Netherlands. And then in the UK, I don't even know if there's a Maritime Humanities. I know there's environmental humanities, some environmental humanities, but not so much, maritime, not, nothing that I know of, Maritime Humanities. And my, my colleague and friend Annette, the, the lady I mentioned from Wageningen University, and I, talk a lot and then we were talking because we both done research with the Bajo in, in Indonesia and we were talking about this Martin Humanities new emerging field. So we, we were the ones starting the conversation in a way and that doesn't mean there's no conversation being had outside that we don't know about so there's always more that we do know about. And um, have I answered some of the questions you, you, gave, you, you posed? Wow. In, a, in a way, yes. And there was something else you asked um, at the end. So, in a sense, for example, in Italy, and before you came here, well, well, when you were working there, is there any maritime humanities focus or, I mean, I don't think Europe has much of that 
maybe the US has more actually in on the West Coast, possibly like California and, and Berkeley and all these um, maritime study centers. But it's more it's, um, environmental scientists again and climate scientists. So no, and then in Europe you don't have that. I mean, it's, it's just in history the people are starting to give the, the maritime historical account more space, no more prominent space because history in Latin is very popular, especially colonial history, and we know why. And, and that gets more fame, and there's also big names and more white males there, so it's also more popular, but then moving beyond history, not so much, and I think it's a shame, honestly, I think it's a shame, and I think that this is something we could talk about and, and, and start moving in a way, I mean, not just us, but like a lot of more people, and the environmental humanities, though, that's why I included them, are more present in a way, and they can relate to maritime humanities, although not necessarily coming within the same framework, but um, same framework. But um, again, the environmental humanities in the Netherlands are, are um, basically literature studies, so poems about nature, which is very interesting as well. Don't get me wrong, it's, it's extremely interesting, but nothing to do with maritime languages, languages and talking about nature, things like that. It's, it's, not, it's not so much about that. So, yeah, barely anything. So, in particular, in your yeah. work in the Netherlands, yes. yes. I mean, is there anything from your work that you yes. already so I was like, yes, self-promotion starts again. Yeah, so, no. so what, what I've done, so I'm reading a, a couple of articles, and there's a book coming at the end of the year, but I'm not here to, to promote anything. But um, So the book and the articles, what they talk about is a lot of the, the sense of space. So identity, space, and place, and languages. So how can we study the environment of islands, small islands, and from a perspective that takes into account the power dynamics of different languages and the different ideas of nature they bring to this space, and also challenging the idea of space as something fixed, socially fixed. An island is just an island, no, it's not. It's other places as well, in terms of kinship, in terms of daily stories, and, and many different things. So, more to do with stretching and challenging those concepts. They are so basic to, to social sciences and humanities in a way, and also linguistics and, and anthropology. But I can send you some, some stuff. I can send some stuff. So formal, isn't it? Uh, so informal. I can send you an email with, with some references if, if you want. There's some. Yeah, but I'll be, I'll be also interested to hear if anyone here, other than okay, also you, of course, but then if other uh, academics who work in the humanities or social sciences, if they have publications or if they have any work they've done to do with uh, maritime places or coastal island places, we call it in different ways. And, and how these places challenge hegemony of concepts like identity, and place, nature, things like that. There must be, I mean, there's, there's, so, there's, there's some people who do, yeah, Ibu, yeah. Thank you so much, thank you for the, your questions. Thank you for your interesting uh, information about uh, maritime humanities. I just want to share that we try our best to do about, uh, to talk about maritime culture, but because I'm from the linguistic department, so University of Indonesia. Yes, yes. yes. Uh, so the only thing that I can start is with linguistic, and actually I have here. She's Dr. Zarmahinia. She's the first uh, PhD in toponymy. But she, uh, geography, geology, and linguistics in one. <laughs> and yeah. uh, her uh, undergrad is actually archaeology. Uh -huh. cool. So uh, her dissertation is so interesting because uh, we're talking about place, toponymy, and she tried to dig all those information from the inscription, from the old manuscript, mm -hmm. and starting from the old ports all along the north coast of Java. Mm -hmm. So Very interesting. Very interesting. Yeah. I learned a lot. When do you finish your PhD? Uh, this year. Last year. Oh, last year. It finished already. Yeah. In, in, in January. Just uh, this year. The article so, was already published in Latin. Already published? Not yet. We'll wait for it. We'll wait for it. Yeah. Sorry, go on. Give to <laughs> so, uh, this is another perspective about maritime humanities. 
maybe uh, we can go further with that and, and, and work together with other uh, discipline. So I just started with this, with her, with the uh, linguistic and archaeology. So maybe I can uh, start, uh, make research together and write You can also together. talk to them. <laughs> yes. Yeah, six and nine, you, know, you, know, you know them, no? Really from before. Yes, so, I know her very Of course, I mean, each of us is an in yeah. interdisciplinary yeah. researcher. Mm -hmm. We all have such a diverse background in different disciplines. So even dividing things by faculty can be challenged because social sciences and humanities, again, are the cross. Yeah. There's so many disciplines. Courses. So people like her, people like all of us, we already do that. But the thing is that there's no um, institution if we need one, I mean, in, in the world of academia, nowadays we do need these things, but then um, in which we can exercise and explore these collaborations. So it ha they have to always be done through conferences, which nobody, not everybody can afford. And if you can afford a conference, where is it? In the same continent where you work? I mean, it, it's challenging in that sense. So the, the mobility of academics nowadays is, is, is extremely power regulated, and also financially, of course, which comes together. And then, um, we miss opportunities like this, talking to each other. So in, in a sense, it's a shame, but then we can start maybe talking about it. Now maybe the, some institutions will give funding to create these networks and create these departments, institutes, draw projects, so submit some projects and then see if it works. You, you could also start with the Universidad Indonesia. Let's start now. <laughs> we start. You can start, yeah. You yeah. Start, I mean, you can start by, by um, I don't know how it is in, in Universidad Indonesia, but like applying for a network, creating a network with some funding to, to organize a seminar or a workshop or something like that for graduate students, uh, undergraduate, postgraduate uh, staff, colleagues, and then um, take that further. And maybe one day have like um, UGM has the Asia Pacific Institute, which per se doesn't call itself Maritime Humanities, but it's also focusing on the sea, but and have one that is just to focus on the sea, coastal settings and, and islands, small islands, big islands, things like that. You will see me? Yeah, I think it's very Thank you for the time. I'm sorry, I have to go very soon. That's okay, thank uh, you for coming. I just want to say, uh, uh, my name is Donna. I'm from Faculty of Social Science, Political and Social Science. I just, uh, I'm on my way to my doctorate uh, proposal. Uh, I, I've been working with uh, Minister of Marine and Fisheries, uh, and my doctorate proposal would be about illegal fishing. Yeah, illegal fishing. Black fishing or, or any, any type of illegal fishing? Uh, well, there's uh, there's something about it, but yeah. I Sorry, cannot... I'm asking you questions. Yeah. <laughs> you My question ahead. is, uh, to build an institution about maritime culture, I think you can uh, gather funding from uh, ministry, ministry a variety of ministry because like uh, from Minister of Marine and Fisheries, uh, well, well, if your research is very beneficial for, for them, I think they don't mind giving you funding for that. And um, well, my research is social science and I'm working with law uh, and it's- Also very interdisciplinary. Yeah, interdisciplinary yeah. and it's very good. And that's why I t attend this presentation and I think it's very good from humanities and maybe we can gather sciences. Yes, and maybe we can gather all of the scholar from variety yeah. of uh, disciplinary. Yeah. And I think that's uh, maybe a solution if you want to make the steps uh, forward. Yeah. yeah. The thing is I think you back as well and it was a conversation obviously this is not just like QA but then um, as I see it from the Netherlands and to talk to other universities, also Indonesia, talk to the Netherlands or, or to, to the UK or any other country. We need to talk in different ways, I think, because um, we only talk in the sense of administration. So I need a counterpart, then you need a counterpart, maybe exchange, but it doesn't, it, it can go beyond there. Some people collaborate beyond further and, and they do publications together, but um, there's so much more you can do taking advantage of these affiliations that we have, and then when we research in a different country, you bring your affiliation and then have a new affiliation, and then 
that's how we can work further, maybe study these networks yes. and these events. So far, Indonesia have uh, used their hard power mm -hmm. with its navy mm -hmm. and its, uh, its police. Mm -hmm. And I think if we study uh, maritime humanities between like uh, uh, this island, this uh, nine island, mm -hmm. and it, it is a borderline between Filipina and Indonesia, yeah. right? Yeah. It's, it's close to the Philippines, I'm yeah. not so close, but yeah, in between. In the yeah. yeah, and if we can study the Philippines as well, yeah. the Philippines, their society, yeah. and we can make a resolution, solution for not um, trying to illegalize our fishing. Exactly. May I yeah. say something about illegal fishing? Sure. Yeah. So is it part of the thesis, the, the, the outcomes that the, you mentioned before, the question you mentioned before? So. Part of this in, in exploring environmental knowledge on Nine Island was because um, the Bunake Tema Nacional has been on a waiting list for UNESCO natural heritage recognition for many years, right? So UNESCO put it on the waiting list and never recognized it as natural heritage. So um, people from Bunake and Manalo, I think as well, they, they submitted a proposal to make it natural heritage because it's a beautiful place and, and it has a lot of uh, uh, is very rich in terms of nature, but also knowledge and, and people and everything. But UNESCO kept saying there's blast fishing, right, in the area. And they can't make it part of the list formally until blast fishing stops. There's no blast fishing in the area. And it's not because it's good or bad. It's not because of a moral system that says it's good or bad. Just because it doesn't fit with the value of knowledge. So from the value side of fishing in the region, blast fishing would contradict the very idea of the, the fish knowing you as skillful and allowing you to catch them. Because you just blast them. So when I asked, I didn't ask people, do you blast fish or not? No, tick the box. No, I didn't do that. But when, when, when we were talking about fishing, I randomly one day after years there, after one year there, I mentioned blast fishing and they were like, they didn't make a moral judgment, although they might have their own opinions, but they said that they, they last, they were like, so it's not, it's not stupid. You know, if you do that, you're compromising already the knowledge. Value knowledge. So the value of nine island don't plus fish, because, not because it's good or bad, because it contradicts the, their own um, knowledge systems and structure. So, for example, in the context of plus fishing, if we employ knowledge from also anthropology or, or linguistics, things that tell you things like that, people might start understanding better what happens really. Because you might look at the nine island and Bunake National Park and think, oh, for sure they did plus fish, the poor fishermen. It's so decisive people, again, simplifying people. Poor fish and all, of course, they do it quickly, and they get more money, and they get rich and all. There's more things. There's complexity, there's sophistication, there's knowledge systems that are different from other places, so you can't assume. But UNESCO assumes, and also environmental scientists assume, not you, <laughs> nothing personal. I assume as well, I mean, we all assume things, and, and when the assumption of things come along the lines of exoticizing people and simplifying people, then I think this type of knowledge can work with the, then another type of political law, uh, regulations and knowledge and help each other in a way. So it's nice that you mentioned uh, blast fishing and, and illegal fishing because I had this idea. Annette, for example, the lady I mentioned from Wageningen University, she researched blast fishing. It was the focus of her research. For me, it wasn't the focus, but it came along. And for her, it was in the Makassai Strait. And she found that some value communities there did blast fishing. So, and some didn't. So it's not the same for everybody. You can't assume the same for everybody. You just have to go and understand. So I think that's why, but for example, if, you, if we told the ministry in Indonesia, the Ministry of Fisheries and, what was it? Me fisheries and marine fisheries, yeah, yes. So if we told them in an application for funding to, to do research or, or network, or in a network, if you told them that um, to understand blast fishing in your law, or, or the practices, that, or whether they happen or not, we have to look at this knowledge system, they might be skeptical. I, I know they would be enlightened. <laughs> They'll be like, what do you mean by knowledge? It's all the same. So it's, pro it's a problem when we talk to people who are not in our context, they might understand what we mean, they might think we're just being stupid or that we don't understand or that we're just making you know, assumptions and they might choose not to listen to this. So to convince ministries, not in Indonesia, anywhere, and convince funders in academia, and outside academia, of the use of our knowledges and, and the use of working together as, as a maritime humanities institute might be challenging as well. So there's challenges that we have to face. Maybe express and communicate things differently in a, in a way that they understand in their own terms, maybe. What do you think? 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's the thing. Also, nobody's knowledge is guided by the amount of data, data size. Which, okay, yeah, I mean, it can give you many things, but it can also drive you away from things. So the bigger the data, the better. Not necessarily. I mean, the, if you have massive data that, that you've been targeting in a, in a way that doesn't make sense for a context, then the data doesn't, no size is, is the relevance, I think. So it's challenging in the sense that we, we say we give them more data. The government works with data, basically. More comparative data across the, the, the Indonesia. And if you have, in the case of palm oil, for example, people who research palm oil, and environmental issues to do with palm oil, the only is data, data, data is here, there, there, all around Indonesia, which is very interesting and convincing and everything, but then what is the basis of it? What is behind the data? What kind of knowledge systems, what kind of ideas of space, what kind of cultures, what kind of languages, what do they tell you before we collect these practices? What is the basis of the practices that exist? I'm worrying you. <laughs> So things like that, I mean, there's conversations that we, we have and there's um, ways that we need to be strategic with the way we communicate things, no? the, so they all can understand what we mean without thinking we're just being seen <laughs> in our own jargon and, you know, in, in our own systems. But thank you, thanks for the question. Yeah. In the subscription context of Mutawai Island, and I use a kind of similar concept of framework as, as what you did, I think which is a kind of uh, relational or human ontologies. And uh, I found it very uh, useful, but also, how do you call it? Uh, it's liberating, you know? To, 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 to think of people or place or seas or waves uh, in uh, their own terms. Mm -hmm. So uh, in that way, I think we can uh, do justice to, to the people or to the non-material, non-human materiality that we talk of in our studies. And uh, related to that, for example, uh, I, I would like to share with you that uh, there is indeed a growing attention toward maritime studies in Indonesia. I know some friends that now engaging in uh, research on uh, maritime cultures and more, actually it's more in anthropology or sociology. But I think it's growing now. But the problem is, I think, uh, it's about what I call uh, ecosectoral, sectoral egoism. Uh -huh. uh, and it's related also with uh, kind of disciplinary boxes that we have in university. Legitimizing ourselves yeah. through drawing boundaries, no? <laughs> yes. yeah, so, yeah. so in Indonesia it's very apparent. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, I was from uh, social sciences uh, faculty, and we know that uh, anthropology, sociology, politics is kind of like you are here. Also in the UK yeah. and in the United yeah. yeah. And that's why I think uh, it's 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 very difficult to build the kind of uh, space for uh, uh, dialogue. And I, last 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 thing is, uh, I, uh, what I learned from Wageningen is uh, uh, we actually can can have a dialogue between disciplines. For example, I was from sociology, but I often have dialogue with uh, students from plant sciences, uh, biologists, uh, chemistry, etc., etc. And actually, what I said, it's very liberating in a way, you know, because. Now you know uh, you, you know more things for sure, but you can also accept, learn, and appreciate uh, how people uh, think and uh, how they do research, etc., etc. And scrutinize yourself. Yeah. 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 Like yeah, yeah. Um, hmm. yeah. I think that's all. And uh, thank you for for your thank, thank you. I didn't know there was somebody from Wageningen in the university. <laughs> So I'm not here to promote Leiden or any university. So, but Wageningen, for example, it, it's starting to do that really well now. It has these um, departments in which you don't even know the discipline because they're all combined into studying one topic. I mean, topic meaning maritime studies or, or environmental studies in a sense. So that is happening there, which is quite nice. And you do feel liberated. I also was in anthropology for very limited. I, I was in, in Durham University Anthropology Department which was divided in between social anthropology and bioanthropology. All the resources went to bioanthropology, and we never had anything, and we were smaller. The social anthropologists were smaller, so we were always like, social anthropologists go to here, and then bioanthropology begins. And we were always competing, there was always competition for, for resources, financial resources, and, and, and research and materials, and things like that, technology as well. And that competition, that, uh, the politics of academia and the limitations that we experience in the other work and everything work against creating these spaces. Precisely because if you're exhausted after a whole semester of teaching, 
and you compete into the sources from these other part of the department that, that does something in a different way, you keep on focusing on these divisions by means of also legitimizing yourself. So you want to be understood as a good professional, so you start promoting your own self-discipline, but that's it. You promote the self-discipline, but then you don't promote the topics you research, or the ideas behind, or the, the methodologies which are more open and fluid, in that sense. So it's, it's us, but it's also outside us. It's the system that we inhabit in academia that is also getting on the way of creating these uh, dialogues. In Indonesia, to my friend Wija from Semanan, from Diponegoro uh, University, he was telling me through Facebook the other day that he teaches 10 courses. You know Wija, yeah? <laughs> 10 courses teaching this semester. He didn't have time to do any research, he couldn't even focus on the topics he researched. So all there's limitations to the things we can do as well in the politics of academia. Nobody just in Indonesia, but in, in other countries. So so yeah, there's a lot going on there. But I mean, saying a lot and just moving on without doing anything, we always do that. So it's also saying, yeah, there's limitations and challenges, but we can work with it. I mean, we're already working with it. If we're already working with it, why not make it some more institutional, you know? <laughs> Somehow institutional. Ah, I get an applause from outside. So in, in a sense, I mean, there's already work that we're doing. So why not make it more out there, more open, more more public in that sense? No, I think in a way. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. So much. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I find a correct link that is missing in our part of the audition, of course. From including how to um, measure like such those things like cultures and also related to the science because, because um, for examples like uh, forestry and also environmental also the like illegal fishing or whatever science and then um, this will be gathered into uh, one recommendation for our government right to make uh, such a brief policy but also uh, what is that? It's kind of uh, really raw materials that will become uh, really, really great sources to make a uh, okay, uh, like a locally apologized, right? Uh, such as things in uh, Bajo, uh, which, which is that will be different policy for maybe the other part of the nation, of or any other uh, 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 because yeah. there's a lot of differences. Yeah. So, uh, uh, maybe uh, could you explain uh, about how? how we could uh, make this such a, such a distance into a, a maybe some institutional ways yes. and it makes like a, in a, I don't know, maybe a, a, like a solution or a recommendation or so that could be offered to uh, maybe some um, local governments or maybe to us in the uh, House of Representatives would be true or as the staff uh, like me and uh, maybe we could make some discussion about yeah. this one because um, this will be really, really useful for us. Okay. Thank you so much. Thanks so much. Very interesting. All questions are, are brilliant, but a um, very interesting point. So I heard, so I read in on another um, Facebook network for research, the Indonesia Research Network or something like that. I read that there's been changes in the visa, right? To research, the visa, the visa there's been, there, there are going to be changes and you have to collaborate with local universities, which I think is great. So through these changes that the government is implementing now to, to, to regulate visas, you could just suggest, okay, so we need to regulate this and make sure that researchers from abroad come here and, and properly legally research and collaborate with the law, which is it, 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 brilliant and it makes perfect sense. It should have always been like that. Maybe an idea like creating a network could be a way to bring these foreign researchers who need a visa and want to come to Indonesia with local Indonesians who already do maritime studies or environmental studies, who have the sources, the knowledge, and, and the contacts, and, and everybody. So it, 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 that could be an idea suggesting that maybe with the visa changes in, in visa regulations to make sure and, and promote these collaborations, there could be networks along the lines of maritime humanities created to facilitate these collaborations. If it's a study that relates to the sea or a coastal uh, setting or, um, <coughs> sorry, I'm just or, an, or an island, or <coughs> sorry, in the sense, because Indonesia is very diverse, there's highlands, a lot of highlands and there's also different urban settings, it could be different networks for, for different things. So. Because Indonesia is such a great uh, massive archipelago, the maritime humanities could be the first one that could be started in a way, not to, to regulate these collaborations and research to do with uh, and there's already researchers working there. So the people have the knowledge is there, research is there, work is there, experience publications, everything is there. Well, well, the only thing is how to, to link the, the, the government, the funders, not just the government, the funders, and, and the researchers. 
in a way that this space is created. I mean, the space is already here. This is space. I mean, we call it the Leiden University Lecture Series, but we could grow. Let's start calling it next year the Man and Humanities Lecture Series, no? or Seminar Series, or something more informal, no? something like oh, the round table, the Man and Humanities Round Table of Universitas Indonesia. I mean, you can start at the government, the Ministry of um, um, Maritime Study, no, uh, Marine and, and, uh, and Fisheries. Yeah, I keep forgetting the name always in English. Um, could might be interested in, in collaborating with universities in Indonesia and, and then seeing and funding these type of things. One thing that you mentioned is an obsession in science in the academia with measuring. <laughs> and this is something that gets on the way sometimes. Um, measuring, measuring, measuring. So we need a, a method, one methodology to measure everything, like, like uh, we uh, discussed briefly before. And it's not the case with the math and humanities or social sciences. There could be many different ways of measuring. Some more scientific me measuring methods could contradict or be sort of opposed to more social m m measuring methods. So it's this idea that we might still feel in the beginning the work of being against each other within this market. It's not an ideal, um, idealized space either. So it, there could be some competition inside. It could still be like confrontations in which some people want to legitimize their knowledge based on power and others want to get theirs as well. So, it will be perpetuating the same system that all the institutes have had before. And yeah. have. So it's not going to be, yeah, there we go. We open the Maritime Humanities today, nice inauguration, and everything is happening. We all know. There will be these um, paradigms, these lives that we have still there. So the, the, the conversation dialogue. Yes, that's the key. 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 Yes, yeah, a divide that we don't even feel yeah. ourselves, but it's sort of imposed by the things we belong to, the institutions or the, the, the academic world we think we belong to and we do belong to. So it, it, these things are sort of imposed sometimes, we embody them, but we know how we feel. I mean, I don't feel I have to compete with, with him or with anyone, or he as a thing. I mean, it's all collaboration, basically, and, and all contributes, and as, as long as we're prepared to listen to each other. In the area studies department, um, I, yeah, in Indonesia. Um, I have two questions, but they are interrelated. Um, the first one is more general. I was curious um, when uh, listening to your lecture why the issue of the Anthropocene didn't uh, come up, because um, mm -hmm. I find it to be quite a concern um, with the environmental humanities, ecological studies. It even perhaps has become a buzzword. So I was definitely a password. Right. So I was wondering whether it was a, a personal theoret a theoretical stance. Um, you don't want to perpetuate the issue, or, or perhaps there's another reason. Um, my second question is more about uh, your research. Mm -hmm. So I was curious whether or not there were any um, changes in nature, um, perhaps sea level rise or um, poisonous um, the algal blooms. Um, mm -hmm whether or not they found a way into the environmental paradigms um, articulated by mm -hmm. the local communities there. Thank you. Very good. Thank you so much. Um, extremely interesting questions. Um, what do we start from? Choose, choose, choose. Um, okay, so yeah, um, yeah, there were changes. I'm going to start from the last. And then remind me if I don't answer the first. Um, there were obviously changes happening. The, the, um, what I was interested in the changes that they talk about, not the ones that I brought from my assessment or, or study of, of beforehand of, of the, the, the region, but um, they talk about, what do they talk about? They talk about more storms during uh, December to March, so there's more heavier storms so people can go out sea. But then some of the people from the island told me that before there were more storms. The now it's better because the boats are stronger and they have more motors, so you don't really feel that so much. So, the accounts of changes in the environment are very political as well. It depends on who's telling you whether this person is a haji who has money to go on more expensive boats, so or is somebody who can't go out of the island so much, or whether it's somebody who is related to somebody who lives elsewhere and sees changes in a different way. So again, this is very relative and, and, and political and also social, obviously. And the changes that I observed, there's plastic contamination. I mean, the main thing is uh, plastic contamination, again, coming from Manado, because the products from Manado were introduced on the island a long time ago, a decade ago, or two decades, uh, as a key to progress. But then what do people do with plastic? There wasn't something there before. So they accumulate, they, they're reused for the seaweed fields to, 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 to let the, the, the rumble cloud float. 
everything is reused there. But then when there's more accumulating and accumulating, maybe you don't, you can't reuse everything because it accumulates and then there's no good um, recycling system there from Manaro, from Wari, from the Cabupaten or the, the Regency. They don't care so much about the island, other than for certain things. So then this, that's one of the things. They don't talk so much about the, the, the island changing because the island has always changed. It has never been fixed in their mind. So it always changes so you don't talk about change because it, it's implicit, it's endemic, it's vernacular as well. And um, there's some fires in the mountain and then, and then trees, there's some deforestation but not so much either. So, and then uh, mention the Anthropocene. You are right. I, I don't want. I mean, the Anthropocene is an interesting term. Geologically, it hasn't been. I think it hasn't been 100 approved yet by geologists. Um, but it's an interesting way to measure um, time, deep time, in a in a perspective that, that includes human agency, but also reinforces the idea of human and the non-human, the distinction between the so-called nature and the non-natural. So, is is human influence new? Is not. Um, is, is human industrial influence new? Yes. Is, is human urbanized influence? Yes, in different places. So these are things, um, these are th complicated things that need more discussion, obviously. But um, what I don't want to perpetuate is this dichotomy of the na nature human na dichotomy. So if I talk to bunch of people about the Anthropocene, the law is super interesting. Yeah. Do you think there should be this category that should be applied to, to a, a period of, of deep, deep time? To be like, yeah, we don't care, really. Yeah, okay, apply it. Or, or, but then again, go before that. What does nature mean there? So that we need the basis, basic knowledge to understand whether that. But in my work, in my work in anthropology, I did study by mentioning um, and Yugai work and, and some of the works on the on the Anthropocene, the new era of the Anthropocene, and, and articles like that. And then again, I dropped it. I thought, I mean, it doesn't make any sense in the context where I am. Because I didn't work with any geologists in particular, so but it's always been human influence. It, the human influence is different. It, it's becoming greater in some parts, and industry influence is different. Completely cap capitalist influence as well. Like I mean, depending on the political systems and the financial systems and the economic systems that we're talking about. But on Nine Island, Anthropocene, not so relevant. I think. I mean, I might be wrong. <laughs> Did I answer everything? Yeah. Thank you so much. Thanks. Yeah, <laughs> Okay.